Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to read just a few verses from uh, Psalm 145. It says, I will exalt you, my God, and my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He is compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. And uh, we re-echo those words <clears throat> in our hearts this morning as we are met to worship the true and living God. So we're going to join our hearts together. We're going to sing this morning. We're going to sing uh, 506, O Lord my God. 506 in our mission praise. Okay, 
Hey, hey. Those are great words, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, could we utter any words better this morning than how great thou art? Um, that's the wonderful thing about hymns, isn't it? We, uh, we get to choose the words that come out of our mouths as a collective group and they're words that praise and glorify and honour the Lord Jesus. So let's have a prayer together. Let's join our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that great and good is the Lord. That you're a, you're a God who is beyond our comprehension. Lord, these small minds that we have, and even in, compa- in comparison with the greatest minds that have ever been, Lord, how could we, how can we comprehend the greatness of God. And this morning we stand here in light of your word, in light of what we've been singing, in light of these wonderful truths. And we say this, that you are the Lord. Lord, there is no one to whom you can be equal. There is no one to whom you can, uh, he, Lord, you can be compared. You have no equal. And this morning we glorify you. And Lord, even, even the, the devil with all of his cunningness and craftiness and his subtle powers, we thank you that he is not your equal. Mm. Uh, he is your created being. Mm. And the potter shall, uh, the clay shall never say to the potter, what, what, what are you doing? And this morning we just bow and, and acknowledge that you are great and that we are weak, that we are small, we are finite. Lord, we, we pop up like flowers in a field and we burst into life, we, we, we mature, we fade and we pass away. And Lord, this has been the story from the beginning um, of time. Lord, we are here for a, fine, for, a, for a small amount of time, for a little season. We are, as James says, we're here. We're here like a mist. We're here and we're gone. And Lord, help us to make the most of, of our time here. Help us to do what we are called to, be what we are called to be, that we would be those who bring glory and honour to you. Amen. You know the fragility, Lord, we know the fragility of life. Um, and you know how uh, how we are desperate, needy uh, people this morning. And we call out to you. Mm. And we cry out to you. And we just say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you that you've stepped out of eternity. Jesus stepped out of eternity and into time. We thank you that he took on himself the form, our human form, and became obedient to death even death on a cross and we thank you that he did it he did it all for our eternal salvation and lord our eternal salvation brings you glory and this morning we just want to glorify you and we want to say thank you lord for saving us and this morning we just pray for this lovely city of of colchester we, uh, we pray for the people who are outside of these doors. We pray, Lord, there is brokenness. And Lord, we know that if Jesus were to walk the streets, as, uh, we, as we read in, in Matthew 9, uh, that Jesus <coughs> uh, uh, had a heart of compassion mm-hmm. because he saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. Mm-hmm. Help us, Lord, to see people as you see people. Mm-hmm. Lord, help us to see people... <coughs> Not in su- some judgmental way, not in some superior way, but Lord, help us to see people as you see them, bro- uh, l- broken and lost and uh, just harming themselves with, with things that are, that are uh, godless and things that are maybe even sometimes good things, but abused things. Mm-hmm. So we commit ourselves to you and we ask that you would bless us today as we meet together from from the oldest to the youngest from the most faithful to the most cynical Mm. to the uh, or whatever other categories we can ever think of lord uh, come to us this morning Mm. and help us to to uh, to live uh, lord just to be open to your word just to hear your word 
and love your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so before we do a talk for the children, we're going to sing another song. It's 708 in our books. 708. To God be the glory. Uh, great things he has done. Now, I omitted to ask, do the children go out for Sunday school? No, they stay in. They stay in the hotel. Okay, brilliant. Lovely. Okay. Okay, so 708. To God be the glory. Sister, let me see what she thinks. Uh, see if she thinks it's a normal glove. Okay, normal glove, Deborah? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think, Joseph? Yeah. Is there anything special about that glove? Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think? No. Nah. Okay. Oh, well, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a letdown, then, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I can assure you that it is a very special glove. Now, this glove can lift things. I can lift things. Okay, would you like to see? Would you like to see this glove lift things? Yes. All right, you like to see it? Okay. Okay, some people aren't too sure. Okay, now I've got a nice big book that I've nicked from, my, from, my, from the other room. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see this glove lift that book. All right? You ready? Okay, let's just see. Let's just see if, if, it, if it works. All right? Okay, ready? Maybe we, should, maybe we should count down. Let's do a three, two, one and see if it works, right? Okay. You ready? Three, Three, two, two, one. one. Did it work? 
didn't work. No, it didn't work. Okay, now there's a little bit of, a, bit, a, little bit of a problem then, isn't there? Um, maybe the book is too heavy. You think? Yeah. You think the book is too heavy? All right, let's, let's go for a slightly lighter book. Well, quite a lighter book, actually. All right, and let's see if it works this time. Right, and let's maybe just give it a little bit of a... A little bit of a head start. Let's just put the thumb under there, all right? Okay, you ready this time? Three, two, one. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> this is a bit awkward. Uh, it didn't work. Did it work? Did it work? Did anyone no. see the move? Even no. a little bit? A little bit? A little bit? A little bit? What about you guys? Did you see the move? No. No? No? Okay. Oh, let's go for a lighter one. Let's try this, all right? Okay. So let's do that, let's put that there. And are you ready? Let's give it another countdown and uh, it's going to be really embarrassing if this doesn't work. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Did it move? All right, you've got a piece of paper there. That's, it's not going to get any lighter than that. Oh, is it right? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Okay, let's do that, let's put that there. All right. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Okay, I'm afraid it's not going to work. This trick is uh, really let me down here. Um, but do you think it would work? Do you think it would work? What do you think, Joseph? What do you think, Joshua? Do you think that would work? No, don't think so. Yeah, of course it's not going to work. Okay, of course it's not going to work. What's going to happen? What's going to need to happen in order for this glove to work? Hand right, okay, let's see if it works this time. All right, so let's put my hand in here. Now let's go for the piece of paper to start with. All right, does that work? Ooh, that works. Okay, let's try the book. Ooh, that works as well. Hang on, this, this, is, this is excellent. What about this big, big, heavy book? Do you think, I can, do you think, do you think this glove can lift up? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> A big book. What, what do you know? It lifted it. There you go. So there actually there's not really anything that special about this glove, is there? What, what is the special thing about this glove? The hand. Exactly. Now that reminds me a little bit about what the Bible says about those who are Christians. First of all, if someone, for someone to be a Christian, they don't just go to church because... Uh, that doesn't work. Someone once said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a burger. <laughs> so that doesn't work. Uh, so it's not just about going to church. It's about repenting and believing and trusting Jesus as your saviour. Now the Bible says something really special happens with that. And that is going to be our message this morning uh, that we're going to be looking at. And it's this, that that the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and comes into your life. Mm. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So without my hand, this glove could do nothing. Exactly. Without me, without my hand, this glove could, could do nothing. So the Bible te tells Christians to love one another. Do you think we can do that on our own? Yeah. No. What do we need? Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit. What about this? What about this? This is even, this is, because we can sometimes love people who love us, but what about the people who don't like us? Is it, is it, is it, can we do that? Can we love people who have maybe hurt us and maybe are hurting us and are rude to us? Can we do that on our own? No. Can we do that with when the Holy Spirit is in our lives? Yes. Yes, we can. The Apostle Paul said this. That uh, he said this. I can. Sorry, I've forgotten the verse. I was going to quote. Um, but that yes, thank you. That say uh, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Can I live in a in in a way that oh, that brings happiness to the heart of God on my own? No. Can I do that with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power? Yes, yes I can. 
Can I do it on my own? No, I can't. Can I do it with God's help and strength? Yes, I can. Does that mean that we're going to be completely perfect all the time? No. But you know what? It, mean, it does mean this, that we can have, that we are no longer slaves to sin. Because God's Spirit in us gives us the power that we need to live in a way that, uh, that pleases God. Can I do it on my own? No, I can't. Can I do it with God's help? Yes, I can. Okay. So we're going to be thinking in a little bit, in, in a little while, just to, well, after we do a reading, we're going to be thinking about, say, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work. Okay, so uh, we're going to have, uh, let me just, uh, what we'll do now is we will, what do we do? We will read. We'll take our Bible reading this morning, and uh, it's Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And um, while you're looking that up, can I just uh, get, say thank you for those of you who prayed for us over the summer. Uh, we had uh, about 110 children and young people came to our summer camps. And uh, at least four, five of them are here. And uh, we had an excellent time. And uh, we had, a, we had a, a great time with all the, the children and, and the young people. And um, we had... A lot of good, solid, faithful Bible teaching. A lot of little small groups where we uh, met together with, with the, the children. And uh, we had a great time. So, so we're going to turn to Acts chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read from verse 1. Okay, is there a page number? Uh, that, we're all there. Okay, we're all there? Okay, that's all right. Okay, so it says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, these all, sorry, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each, sorry, how is it that each of us hears them in our native language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonderful, sorry, the, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you this, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those in those days and they will prophesy I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved we'll end our reading there and uh, we'll have 
um, another song and uh, then after that we will just have a look at uh, this passage. So we're going to sing 611 in the mission praise, Spirit of Holiness. Let's have a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the promised Holy Spirit. We thank you that he has come. We thank you that he is here. We thank you that he lives in our hearts. And we thank you that he has uh, renewed us and brought new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Holy Spirit does not make his uh, first appearance in Acts chapter 2. In fact, the Hebrew term for the Spirit of God, excuse me, appears over 90 times in the Old Testament. The instances of the Holy Spirit's encounters with people, the people of Israel in the Old Testament, was much less related to personal salvation or modifying a person's character, but was more about empowering or equipping A person for a God-appointed task in order to accomplish a divine plan. Samson, for example, uh, his mighty deeds were performed when the Spirit of God came upon him mightily, as Judges 14 verse 6 says. The Spirit of God also enabled some like Joseph and Daniel to... uh, give dreams or to have dreams and also to interpret dreams and visions. Beelzel in Exodus chapter 31 verse 2 to 5 was gifted by the Spirit of God to do much of the artwork in relation to the tabernacle. We see in Genesis, Genesis 1 verse 2, we see the Spirit's role in creation. And how the Spirit is hovering over the waters and superintending over all of the creation. Acts chapter 2 is a turning point, however. The difference of the Spirit's work in the Old Testament and in this new era is is now the permanent indwelling of the Spirit in believers. As Jesus said regarding this the change of the Spirit's ministry, he says, but you will know him, in chapter John 14, verse 7, but you will know him, 
For he will live in you and be with you. Now the event of Pentecost uh, is, is one that we are, uh, if we've been in church any length of time or any number of years, uh, we will certainly be familiar with uh, what happened at Pentecost. So first of all, I just want to think about the event. Uh, then I want to think about the power um, that, that um, evolves, that comes from it. First of all, Pentecost was a Jewish feast. It was a celebrated, it was a celebration of, of harvest. It typically came on the 50th day after the Sabbath, after the Sabbath of the Passover. And it was on this particular Pentecost celebration that the Holy Spirit was poured out on those who were followers of Jesus. You see, while the Spirit was active in the Old Testament... This was a new and more extensive dimension to his activity with an empowering presence in the lives of believers. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 22 says this, and you, uh, sorry, and in him you too are being built up together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see, before the ascension, Jesus uh, said to his disciples, Behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Luke 24 verse 49. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has gone and the Spirit is to come. And they're instructed to stay uh, in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Now there's two things I want to say about this, about the event. First of all, it was unmistakable. There were three distinct phenomena uh, that are described here in the text that we read. When the Spirit comes. Uh, and these phenomena are likely to have been uniquely for those who waited in the upper room. And the reason... For the phenomenon uh, is to make it abundantly clear that the promised Holy Spirit, who would be this their power from on high, had actually come. This was an event that was so definitive that no one would be left sitting around uh, uh, asking each other the question, well, did you feel what I felt? This was not about feelings. This was something that was stark, something that was evident, something that would be a definitive line in the sand that a new era had, had come. And people were, were, would have, uh, no one was in any doubt. And it wasn't a, a case of, of uh, emotions, it was a clear clear sound like that of the that signals the, the the sound that signals the start of a race uh, this was the start of a new era now the sound it was a sound it was not the wind but it was like a mighty wind filling the entire house uh, there there were um, uh, what seemed what seemed to be it was not tongues of fire but it seemed like tongues of fire dividing and resting upon them individually. I often wonder what that looked like and um, what would have been to witness that. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues. Tongues, not, tongues other than their own tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. The sound like a wind, the tongues of fire and the speaking in other tongues are not universal marks of the Holy Spirit. They're not universal marks of God, the Spirit's presence. But it gave a clear and distinct line in the sand. A new era is here. Now, is it always that dramatic? God uh, speaking, God coming, God moving. No, it's not always that dramatic. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 12, God speaks in a whisper. To show Elijah that the work of God need not always be accompanied by dramatic revelation or manifestations. Is God among us at uh, work among us this morning? Oh, yes. I haven't seen any tongues of fire. <laughs> 
I don't hear anything blowing. And I'm sure any, any languages that, that, that there are are l- languages that we've learned. All phenomena and dramatics, uh, it, it, are, uh, these are not the distinctives uh, or the hallmarks of, of God at work. God is at work, but God can be at work in the quiet and the places. Also this, it was unrepeatable. Uh, the Pentecost event was a one-off event. It was, unrepeat- it was an unrepeatable part of God's redemptive story. Now, I, I do have a, a high regard for William Booth, and I get the sentiment when he, when he wrote that hymn, um, look down and see this waiting host, give us the promised Holy Ghost. We, need, we want another Pentecost, send the fire. That's a great hymn, but we know what he we know what he means. But in a sense, in the in strictest sense, Pentecost was was an original event, and we need to view this event in the terms of the whole story of Jesus. There was only one day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people. We need to view the Pentecost of event, the pouring out of the Spirit, the way we view the incarnation. We don't need another incarnation. We don't need another crucifixion. We don't need another resurrection. We don't need another Pentecost. <clears throat> we never need to stand and gaze up uh, like the disciples did as Jesus ascended into heaven because it will never happen again. Pentecost is the inauguration of this new era that was prophesied by Joel that we read in verses 17 to 21. And while the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit occurred once, the effects of that, the, this new, um, new era, <clears throat> or the fruit of the Spirit's coming, are experienced at all times throughout the course of church history. We see it in revivals. We see it in the, in, the, in, the, in the small, silent, quiet ways of a heart being changed on a daily basis. So that's the, that's the event. It was, uh, it was uh, unmistakable and it was unrepeatable. But I also want to think about the power. What was uh, the power? And uh, power for a number of things. First of all is this, Um, Acts chapter 1 verse 7, uh, Jesus said to them in chapter 1 verse 7, he said, it is not for you to know the times or dates. The disciples were getting um, themselves in a knot because they were still thinking that Jesus uh, Jesus' kingdom was an earthly kingdom. But he says this, um, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set uh, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus explains here in chapter 1, verse 7, to these faltering, still faltering and still somewhat confused disciples, what is about to happen. They are still thinking that Jesus' mission is, is, is an earthly one. They think still thinking uh, of a political, geographical kingdom. <clears throat> but Jesus uh, says, my kingdom is, uh, Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom that is established through his death and resurrection. You see, the, the purpose of the Spirit's coming was to empower them to be witnesses for Jesus in a hostile world. And we see just how hostile their world was. Because just 50 days prior. 50 days or so prior. They murdered Jesus. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. I think it was James Montgomery Boy said. Is not. Was not given as a toy to play with. But as a means of power. To witness through. You see, the Spirit wasn't given to give us 
warm, fuzzy feelings or to have enjoyable spiritual experiences, although those things may happen. Rather, it is given so that every believer from this point onwards can have a bold witness of how Christ has changed their lives and how he can take the worst of sinners and change them and uh, and change them from being a rebel to being a worshipper now what can account for the early church's boldness how can we go from 120 people in an upstairs room uh, some of whom had just deserted Jesus six short weeks earlier to boldly preaching in verse 38 when Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. How can we account for that? It can only be by a power that is beyond themselves. How can I be bold for the Lord Jesus today? <laughs> We can take evangelism courses. We can take theological training. We can sharpen up our, our, our apologetic abilities and arguments. And those things may be helpful and necessary. But what we need is something beyond what we have. We need the Spirit's boldness. Amen. And while the Spirit may indwell us. We need to submit to that, uh, to him, and know that power in our working out through our fingertips and our words and out of the words that are out of our lips. How can we do it? We can't do it. How can we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit? Also, power to witness. But the Spirit was given uh, for change, for power to change. Uh, the whole scripture is all about Jesus. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. And um, it's a well-worn adage that, uh, that in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus is predicted. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. In Acts, Jesus is preached. In the epistles, he is explained. And revelation, he is expected. And the same is true when we come to the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the Holy Spirit through the wide lens of Scripture. We can't just pick out a, a little bit in Acts and a little bit somewhere else. Uh, we've got to understand this. And through the epistles, we see that there is... Through the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, a power to change. Uh, when we come to Christ, uh, we are repentant and our, our faith is in him. But there is a big distance between who we are and how we act. Or how we act and what the Bible teaches. And through the journey of the Christian life. That journey is a journey of narrowing the gap between our creed and our conduct, our belief and our behaviour. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is power to change. Sin has no longer got dominion over us. We are not no longer slaves to sin. We are saved from the, from the, the presence, uh, from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the, the, the power of sin. And one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. And Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, And we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So our changing from glory to glory, our narrowing of that gap, is by his spirit. By his spirit. We sometimes give the impression as, as Christians. That um, 
and I always think of this in, in the context of, of when my little, well, my daughter, who's now 21, uh, was learning to, to ride her bicycle. You know, I would steady her up, start her off, and hope to goodness she'll make it. <laughs> That's not the Christian life. That's not the Christian life. We are saved by grace. We are empowered by the Spirit. And every day we are empowered by the Spirit to, to live in obedience uh, and to change, to be more Christ-like. The Holy Spirit is changing us, transforming us as we submit to him and the directives of his word. To be more like Jesus as we submit ourselves to him. The way clay submits to the potter. He calls our perspectives. Our ideologies. Our ideas. Our opinions. Into line with his revealed will. And his revealed will is his word. Paul again says to, to, the, to the church at Rome. He says therefore I urge you brothers and sisters. In view of God's mercy. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's more than just changing your opinions. It's allowing your opinions to be uh, dissolved into his will and mind. So he changes us, not by... Human will, not by just dragging yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, but by the power of the Spirit. He changes us. He molds us. He breaks down our sin. And he conforms us to his image. Also, there's power to, uh, power to witness. There's power to witness. There's power to change. <clears throat> excuse me but there's also power to endure power to endure in, Col in Colossians 1 verse 11 Paul talks about being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might that you might have great endurance and patience so he's talking about being strengthened by God with, with, with the greatest strength that is imaginable Yes, there is power to be bold with your faith and to reach out and speak to people about Jesus. But there's also power to endure. Power to endure. Um, and Paul says here, this um, uh, there, uh, power in two areas. And power where actually we need a, a very much a power to endure and power to have patience. Now we're not just talking about patience with being patient, putting a thousand piece jigsaw together. That's um, different. But it's, in, it, it's patient during tribulation and difficulty. You see, this demonstration of power does not get us power uh, in the world, in the eyes of the world, this is not greater authority over our contemporaries, but power where we need it most: power to endure and power uh, to have patience. Now, there's a subtle distinction between these two words. Endurance implies the ability to bear up under difficult circumstances. Patience, I'm told, is closely related to endurance, but patience is enduring and being patient with difficult people. We've all got some of those, don't we? Maybe we are those. Um, we're all those, actually. Either way, Paul prays that they would endure through difficult situations that will inevitably come our way. Now, there, there are two things that we can be sure of, and, and one, is, one is taxes, and uh, the other one is trouble. Uh, two things that we can be sure of in this world. Uh, Jesus said, in, in this world you will have trouble. It, amaze, uh, it shouldn't amaze me, but it, it, it's amazing how sometimes people, Christian people, think we should not have trouble. We should just glide through this life uh, because God's on our side. Well, we only come to those conclusions with, 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 with closed Bibles. Because Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. 
Job said, a man who is born of woman of a woman is, is few of days and full of trouble. Trouble is afoot. If we're not walking from trouble, we're walking into trouble. The trouble is all around us and full of difficulty. And uh, the, the reality here is this. How do we, when we think of the Spirit's power, you think, yes, he gives me power to witness. But what about the tough stuff? What about the difficult people uh, that, I, that I work with, that I go to school with, that I live with? What about these people? What about the Spirit's power coming into play in these situations? Um, <clears throat> Corrie Ten Boom um, tells the story of uh, when she was uh, a little girl, she, um, uh, she would get very frightened and very anxious. And... Um, she spoke to her dad, and her, her dad said to her, do you, know, do, you remember, do you know when we go to Amsterdam uh, to pick up some of the pieces? When do I give you your ticket? Uh, he said, and she said, you give me my ticket when I need it, when it is requested. Okay? So she said, he, his point to her as a little 11-year-old girl was this, when you need the help that you need and the tough stuff that you'll face, God will give you your help when you need it most. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's it, isn't it? Now, she didn't know that the trouble she was going to face. And hopefully none of us will ever face anything like what she faced. But when does God give us? We, we don't just have bags of, of help that's there waiting in the wings. It's given to us when we need it. It's given to us when we need it. You see, it's... We can say all kinds of truthful things to our unbelieving friends. But when they see us stand up under trial and difficulty, our hope becomes so evident becomes so evident so power power to witness power to change power um, uh, power to endure and lastly power to save so in Acts chapter 2 this once weak need Peter stands up and boldly proclaims Jesus power Je uh, proclaims Jesus through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Now, after Peter makes his, his case that Christ was their long awaited Messiah and that they had allowed him to be tried before Pilate, crucified, and after three days uh, he was raised from the dead, it would have been amazing to witness this. They call out, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter responds, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit and on that day 3,000 people accepted their message they repented they believed they were added to their number Peter had just recited the the, the words of the, of the prophet um, that those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved about but, but saved from what? Saved from dying in their sin. Saved from being lost for all of eternity. Saved from being excluded from God's heaven forever. Saved from uh, this. Jesus said to the Pharisees, John in John 8, 24, he says, I told you. He says to the Pharisees, I told you. That you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. And that is the reality of those who do not trust in Jesus. And the power of the Holy Spirit illuminates and opens the eyes 
of those who are indifferent, those who are agnostic, those who are atheistic, those who are complacent. And he opens the eyes of those people. He opened your eyes. He opened my eyes. He opens the eyes of those who are complacent. Paul referred to the Christians in Ephesus as those who were dead in, who had been dead in their sins. What, would it, what does it take for a dead man to be raised to life? What would it take? Now, and I, I know the, um, the Suffolk and Norfolk context better than, than, than Essex, but what would it take for the most zealous Ipswich Town supporter to switch his allegiance and say, from this point on, I'm with Norwich City. Wouldn't happen, would it? (laughs) Okay, what would it take for a stadium full of over 3,000 of those Ipswich Town supporters to say, from this day forward, I'm with Norwich City? It wouldn't happen. It's a miracle. And with all the powers of persuasive speech... Not one of us could ever manage that. It is power to save. It is the power to save. And yet this is what happened. And the stakes were even higher. Uh, For those who repented and were baptised, they were now the outcasts. They were not part of the, the, the party crowd, they were just they had just been branded or would to be would to be branded as the turncoats. And it was now for them to face the persecution of their uh, because they had given their lives and allegiance to Jesus. But the Spirit had unveiled their eyes. They can now see what else could they do? What else could they do? And we turn over another couple of pages in, in the book of Acts. Then their, 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 their uh, number are expanded to 5,000 people. Why would you choose that? Why did they choose that? Their eyes were opened and they could do nothing else. And they responded to the gospel. And they were saved. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must, uh, must deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? These people, they responded to the gospel. They embraced persecution. And they followed their Lord. The power, that power was not, is not exclusive to the first century. That power is available today. If you repent. If you repent. I have gone my own way. I have lived my way in God's world. I have taken the gifts that God has given, but I've rejected the giver, and now I turn to you. And belief. I realize that that, uh, all of my rejecting has been offensive, and I have offended God, and this deserves judgment. Jesus went to the cross to take the judgment on my behalf. I trust in his merits, in, uh, in his Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, to eradicate my sinful past and to secure my future. We know those words so well, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him... <coughs> Will not, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. This morning, I just want to say this. If you are not yet a believer, um, Jesus can save you. All of your past can be eradicated 
and you can be found just like Noah and his family were safely in the ark. You can be safely in Christ. For, for those of us who are, who are believers, know this, that it's the Holy Spirit lives within us. It's not a Jesus starts us off and saves our souls and then leaves us to it. He is with us. He is with us. He has power to save. He has power to change. And gives us power to endure. I don't know what you're going through today. And, and what I do know is this. In life, I am really, really looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth. I really am. Um, I'm really I, I'm looking forward to that so much. When, when there's a restoration of all things. Hallelujah. Uh, and but but until that day, you know, I'm the ripe old age of 48. For some of you, that'll sound ancient. For some of you, that'll sound young. For some of you, that might even sound familiar. But but however long we've got left on this life, we will face trouble, and difficulty. But there's power to endure. There was power to endure. And there is power to witness. To be a bold witness in a hostile world, in a hostile environment that's growing more hostile still. And we are called to stand. We are called to love the Lord and to love people and to be a witness for him. And what greater way can we love people than to hold out, than to shine like a star in our witness, but also to hold out the word of life, the good news that that Jesus is that it's not just a, a, a Jesus is not just a, a prize for the winners. He's a refuge for sinners, and that includes all of us. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing our, our last song, um, Holy Spirit. Or no, sorry, it's not. It's Oh Church Arise. Oh, church, your eyes. Oh, 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you that we are not left as orphans. We thank you that the Holy Spirit lives within us. We thank you that, he, that the Holy Spirit takes the truth of your word and imparts, us to, imparts it to us, not just in understanding, but to enable us to narrow that gap between what we, uh, what we say we believe and how we and how we behave. So we thank you, and we pray that you will give us that endurance today. Uh, Lord, just as that, that song says, give uh, strength uh, for every hurdle, and uh, put strength in every stride that we take. We pray for our witness that it would be bold. We pray that, uh, that, you would, that we would just also just witness your power to change power to uh, power to witness power to change and lord power to save father we just want to see people around us saved mm. we want to see lord we'd love to see three thousand people in colchester oh. this morning uh, just say what must we do and for them to respond to us saying repent and believe uh, lord we just we pray we would see that again in this nation amen. we pray we would see it again in this city we pray we would see great things amen uh, not that uh, we would see uh, just a greater amount of skill or professionalism or or mm. or, or uh, uh, work in the flesh, mm. but that we would see you at work. Amen. And we pray you would revive your church Amen. and uh, that you would open the eyes of those who are born blind. In Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.